So we know the basic building blocks of convolutional neural networks now, in essence, just convolutional layers, which perform convolutions on our data in structural data, mainly filtering of the data with a small filtered kernel, and probably pooling layers. And pooling layers can be replaced by strided convolutional layers. Now, what we really haven't discussed yet is uh, why these networks are so effective on data that looks sometimes quite challenging. And now let's, let's discuss this a little bit. And the key thing to understand here is the difference between invariance and equivariance. Now you probably agree with me that, that this image here is the image of a cat. It shows a cat in the center of the screen. So any sensible discriminator, the traditional machine learning or deep neural network should output that this is a cat. Some one dimensional vector where the class representing the entry representing cat lights up as a one. Now, what's about this image? This, this image is also a cat, right? It's just at a slightly different location in the image. Our human visual system does not have any problem with that. We will always clearly say this is a cat. Now, if you imagine if you would say, say implement it in a heuristic way and, and link some sort of heuristic to every pixel of your image and say, if this pixel has this and that color range, then the combination of all of those become a cat, then, then you probably will agree with me that this is a pretty bad discriminator because as soon as I do this, your entire heuristic algorithm will break down and you won't get the answer cat anymore for this. So, so I, as a human, I don't care where the cat is located. I would like also an image discriminator or whatever data discriminator to always give me an output as, as output cat if there is a cat object in that image. Ideally, I also won't, wouldn't care about the background here. The background is just white here um, in terms of uh, because of simplicity. Now, now this, is, this is what we call shift invariance. A discriminator that can still classify an image like this as a cat is called shift invariant. So a network that is insensitive to shifts of the object of interest in an image is, is called shift invariant. It, it will not produce a different variant of the output only because the object of the, in, the in the image space underwent some sort of linear transformation. So, so shift invariance really means that the output of the left function here so shift invariance really means that the output of uh, this function here on the left is exactly the same as the output of the same function applied to a transformed translated image here on the right. If you, if you haven't thought so already, deep, deep, deep networks aren't intelligent or do anything magical. Really what we do is the same in, as in traditional machine learning. We fit a function, we try to find a function that models our input space, our training space well enough so that it generalizes to new input data. Now this deep network is this F, this is our function F and it should always output a uh, cat here for these images. So our function F performs a transformation from a high dimensional input space, our cat image, r to the power of d to a low dimensional output space cat, dog, car, truck, bridge, whatever. Right? This is very low dimensional. Now we, we can define this shift operator as S with the subscript V, where V in this case just describes this small vector by which we translate this cat in the, in the image. So this operator does an R to the power of D to the R power of D, same input space transformation. Right? So it's shifting the image by, by the vector F, uh, V. So, so that, that input space can be thought of some sort of vector space. The shift operator transforms the coordinates in some way of the object, um, which is defined by this vector V. So, so shift invariance basically means this, the, the output of F of X equals the output of uh, the same input transformed by S with the same function, right? Now, what is, what is shift equivariance? Where equivariance means 
that the output shifts in the same way as the input. Now, now let's assume we have a different model that segments the cat. So that means we want to label every pixel that belongs to the cat as one and all the pixels that belong not to the cat as zero, background or the white space here in this image. So, so in this case, the output of the cat detector should shift exactly the same way with the same vector field as, as the input is shifted. So basically shift equivariance means that um, S, S of F of X is exactly the same as F of S of S times X. So basically F and S commute. Now this can be visualized in this way and probably this is a slide to, to remember. On the left we see invariance. The output is always the same regardless what S I apply here. And on the right, we see equivariance, where if I shift this input with the operator S, the, my, my deep network, my function F, will output the same high dimensional space, but transformed, right? So the same segmentation of the cat. Now, where do we find now invariance and equivariance in our deep networks? So basically we have, convolutional layers that are supposed to be shift equivariant. So the convolutions are shift equivariant and the pooling layers or strided sub subsampling approximate shift invariance, right? Convolutions shift equivariance, pooling shift invariance. So, so why is that? If we, if we look at an image from a very popular um, benchmark data set, this is MNIST, this is just the number three. We know we all write three in slightly different ways. But if we convolve this image three with that three by three filter here, very, very, very simple filter, we, we will get an output like this. And, and it doesn't matter if I shift this by a little bit, the output will, will be the same. Right, so it, it will look basically the same. Ignore the scale here. This is just an error on the slides. So, so I just shift a little bit on the right and the output looks more or less the same. So the activation of that filter is, is pretty much the same. It, 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 looks, uh, it looks equivariant, right? So if I shift the image a little bit, in convolutional layers, the filters will produce the same response at the location of that input image. So they will shift in the same way as the input. Now in terms of invariance, if I look at the pooling layers, then pooling layers build up sh shift invariance so approximately. If I shift the image a little bit here, then under this pooling kernel, under this pooling window, still the same maximum will be found, right? So, so, so it is the same kind of maximum. Th this is only locally true, right? If I shift too much, then this will not be true anymore. It isn't, the pooling is not completely bulletproof in respect uh, with regards to uh, shift invariance, but at least locally, it, it will find the same maximum. So with these two components, we would assume that convolutional neural networks are shift equivariant and shift invariant. And to a certain extent, that's true. Our networks can identify a cat wherever it is in the image or three wherever it is in the image. Now, inter interestingly, you can do a lot of thorough experiments. And for example, the colleagues here in uh, last year, ICML did some experiments and animated this, these two uh, images from the Cypher data set. So these are just lots of different classes. But what we see is it's, it's only true to some extent. So when these images are shifted, the output of the classifiers vary vastly. Right, the baseline here is the out, is the output of the classifier. The right thing is what they did then to mitigate this problem. But if you only look at the left bars here, despite the image not really changing, the classification result is really fluctuating a lot. Now the reason is because striding and pooling basically 
breaks our uh, invariance assumption, our equivariance assumptions, because by subsampling in a naive way, we violate the Nyquist sampling theorem. So if you don't remember Nyquist, Nyquist simply says that you have to sample at least twice as fast to keep all information. All right, if we subsample by two or have a stride of two somewhere, we lose obviously information without doing anything specific to it like they did in this paper. Um, so they also show a nice toy example in, in their talk, which, which I'll try to reproduce here. So if you just look at a very, very, very simple signal, a signal that goes from zero to one to zero to one, and we sample that at equidistant points, right? We sample it here, we sample it here, we sample it here. Then what we get is if we first sample, do max pooling, for example, here, we get a sample here, zero, the maximum of zero and zero is zero, obviously. Then we do another max pooling step here, the maximum of one and one is one. Then if we do another max pooling step here, the maximum of zero and zero is, is zero and so on. All right, we get, we get an output signal of the max pooling layer that looks like this. Now, if I just shift my, my pooling layer, the, the input a little bit, say by one, right? What I get is now my max pooling layer does a uh, maximum of zero and one, right? The maximum of zero and one is one. So my next sample is one. And also here, the maximum of one and zero is one. And here, the maximum of zero and one is one. Now, I guess you will agree that this function looks vastly different from that function. So the signal that comes out after the pooling layer is highly dependent on the shift of the input data. So this, this breaks our shift equivariance of, of convolutional layers. Right, the solution they propose is to do things from traditional computer vision where everybody learns in early vision courses that the right way to downsample is to first blur and then downsample the image, which approximates um, information preservation. So they build they 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 basically use uh, blur blurring filters to mitigate this problem and then show that uh, things like classification works nicer. Also, image generation actually works in a better way if you if you make your pooling layers or striding layers a little bit more shift equivariant. So we can extend this beyond translational shift and apply this to any group operation. Uh, groups is just a fancy term from math that are simply collections of operations that have the property of closure, they say. So they are any operations where if you put two of them and put them together, if you concatenate them and do the first one and then the other one, then you will get a third member of that group. Okay, so simple example would be rotations. If I first, for example, here, rotate that cat a little bit and then a little bit more, or if I concatenate, concatenate these two and first multiply the matrices with the rotation matrices with each other, the resulting rotation matrix will also be a member of that group. And if I apply this member to the cat, it will immediately result in the rotation, which we would otherwise see by smaller rotations. This is just a simple uh, example. Groups really encompass a, a huge aspect of, um, uh, of transformations. Now, the same is true here. If I apply this group action here, this, this rotation, I want my discriminator to classify this as cat still, despite being it rotated slightly. The same is true here. I want I want it to be equivariant to these uh, to these rotations and also find a similar uh, location or um, or generate similar similar images. For example, segmentation. The segmentation should rotate the same way. Um, so this is this is vastly more complicated than than just shift invariance. There have been there has been a lot of research in this direction, and and for example, some people looked into uh, using spherical harmonics to describe them in a rotation invariant way. This this paper, for example, does um, does an interesting approach here. Translation uh, equivariance. 
If we translate an input image to a CNN, then its features will also translate with a proportional step size. Importantly, if we place a motion compensated window around the features, then we see that the form of the translated features remain stable. So this is shift equivariance. This property arises by design from the translational weight tie structure of CNNs. If instead we consider input rotations, then we see that the motion compensated features are not stable at all. Moreover, it is non-trivial to infer the relationship between two feature maps which differ only in rotation. Only in rotation. So as you could see, the features change a lot during this rotation. That, that, that's a bad thing for your classifier that has little spatial information anymore later on in the learning system. Now, now when they apply their spherical harmonics, the problem, of course, goes away. Returning so, to a motion compensated view of the feature maps, we see that indeed harmonic networks are able to preserve deep features under rotation. So nothing so changes anymore. Compensated window side by side, the extra stability we are granted becomes. And you can see it's still only approximately correct because there are still some changes. Now, this can be even generalized to operations that are not necessarily described by groups. And, and in particular, we can talk about deformations. And if you think about the MNIST example, everybody of us writes the number three here slightly differently. But if you think about this more, the, the differences are mainly, mainly smooth deformations, small local deformations. So we can think of other operations like warping operations as small local perpetrations like variants of smooth transformations of a canonical tree, something that uh, you can see in the image here. I still want my classifier to be equivariant towards that and tell me that this is actually a three, regardless of how warped or oddly that three is written by some person. Um, so we can think of these deformations basically as small local shifts small local constant shifts probably so so cnns are so successful because we can model these local shifts because of their shifts equivariant but the problem really he here is the deformation field tau it really depends on how different this tau is from locally constant shifts right the, 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 the more warp the whole image gets the less it looks like a constant shift, the less our network will be able to, um, to infer what, what the right uh, answer is to this problem. So, so what do we learn from this equivariance and invariance discussion? Well, A, CNNs are approximately shift equivariance through convolutional layers and they contain convolutions and they are also approximately shift invariant because of the pooling and striding operations uh, which act as subsampling operations. Well, B, mathematically, all of this is a little bit hand wavy because it depends on the type of problem one tries to solve. In, in theory, CNNs do very basic but learned signal processing operations, learn from the data we present it with. And in practice, often what works is accepted and some attempts to explain certain mathematical properties of common building blocks of deep neural networks for sometimes short of, um, uh, of, of, of proper explanations. Well, see, in, in practice, equivariance and invariance will be improved through encoding expected and, and realistic data transformations directly into the data. So this is called data augmentation. Basically, I already showed the network possible transformations of the image, which can contain warping and all of these things. We'll talk about data augmentation in a future video.